Well, <clears throat> as, we, as we know, the, the work of evangelism and missions comes up quite a bit uh, in the Bible because that's really what um, uh, the work Jesus has entrusted to his church was all about. It was the work that he was all about. And yet, um, again, it's one thing that we don't perhaps think about or get involved in as much as we, as we ought or perhaps at the levels at which we are able to. And again, we have to remember this isn't something that um, we just kind of jump in all at once. Uh, perhaps that's the thing that makes it most daunting. We feel like we, we have to go from you know, the, the plane, as it were, and jump to the mountaintop maybe in one or two leaps. But really, our Lord expects us just simply to take steps and to make it a step at a time and, and to grow in, the, in this area and, and to do the very best that we can do. But we really do need to focus on doing this. And, and really, again, I'm speaking to myself as to all of us here. This is something that is on our Lord's heart, and we see that in our text this morning. What I'd like to do is read Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Lord willing, by the time uh, the day is over, we'll actually have covered everything in this chapter because this chapter is really composed of three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. What we want to do is look at the first two this morning and look at the, uh, the final one of this evening. So let's begin by reading verses one, uh, 1 through 10 that give to us the first two parables and the context in which they were shared. So beginning in verse 1, we read this. Now all the tax gatherers and sinners were coming near to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me. For I found the coin which I had lost. In the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our uh, edification this morning. Now again, so that we don't lose track of what we saw last week, and I think what we saw last week kind of leads into what we're seeing this week, let me just remind us that last week Jesus told us that in, in order to be his disciple, there is a, a cost that we need to be willing to pay. There is something we must be willing to do. And let's not forget that to be a disciple is not, again, a second level of Christianity. It's not for the elite few that are really committed. But he's talking about <clears throat> to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, to be his. And what we must do is we must love him the most. We have to love him more than father or mother more than wife or husband, more than our children, more than our brothers and our sisters. Again, sometimes the gospel puts us at odds with them. We must be willing to own Jesus and do what is right, regardless of how they might respond. Jesus said the gospel, he says, don't, don't think that I came to bring peace. I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. Sometimes the gospel will divide households. He said we must love him more than our own lives. As long as we're concerned primarily for our own safety, we're not going to be willing to do everything that the Lord might ask us to do. We're not going to be willing to put it all on the line for Him. I mean, think about Paul. If he was concerned primarily for his safety, would he have been able to do everything the Lord called him to do? Would Peter or John or the other apostles? And what about the martyrs of church history? I think they would have holed up somewhere and waited until the persecution blew over, but they didn't. Instead, they stood up bravely for him and they proclaimed the gospel, even though it meant they had to give their lives. Well, that's exactly what our Lord Jesus did, and that's what he calls us to do. 
Jesus said we must love him more than our own comforts. On one occasion, there was a man who came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And then Jesus said to him, you need to count the cost first before you decide or make that decision. He says, you know, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, which means it's going to be a difficult road for you. Are you willing to face the difficulties that following me is going to entail? Uh, Jesus said we also need to count the cost to see whether we're willing to face those difficulties, whether we're willing to make the sacrifices, whether we're willing to do the hard work. Now, he also said that we have to make sure that we're willing to do that, but that we're willing to see it through to the end, that we're willing to finish what we start. And he told us that along the way, there's going to be many enemies that we're going to have to battle, spiritual enemies, the desires of our flesh, the things that, that are within us, those desires that are always trying to get us to go the wrong direction and to do the wrong things. We have to fight against it. We need to put it to death. We need to fight against the devil, resist him. And he's prowling about, Peter tells us, as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And we also need to be able to resist the world where the devil has laid many of his traps hoping to ensnare us. And again, Thomas Brooks reminded us the devil is a master fisherman. He knows what's going to trap us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows, you know, where we're going to be most liable. And so he'll lay the snares in that area. Don't think just because something's in this world and because you desire it that it's necessarily good. We have to read what the Bible says and understand where the devil has laid his snares in the world. Now, in other words, we need to be like... Um, like that brave soldier that Pilgrim, uh, excuse me, that uh, Bunyan tells us about in Pilgrim's Progress, the one that Mr. Interpreter was telling Pilgrim about. He was the one who saw this palace and on the top all the people were enjoying themselves and he wanted to go in, but at the door it was guarded by all these other soldiers and in order to get in he had to be willing to fight them and to overcome them and that's exactly what he did. We have to be willing to fight that fight even as he fought it. We need to be willing to give everything we have to the Lord, our body, our souls, our gifts, our time, and our resources, and to put it to whatever use He calls us. You know, John Bunyan, um, it's interesting, isn't it, that Bunyan and Spurgeon uh, and um, Thomas Brooks, if you ever want to read him, were masters at illustrating things. And in his autobiography called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, he has a picture that I think is, is, um, sort of teaches us in, in just this one image what it is that our Lord calls us to do. And he pictures the cost that we must be willing to pay as, as a narrow gap in a wall through which he had to struggle in order to reach the place of blessing on the other side, a place where the, the sun, as it were, was just sort of beaming in this beautiful hill where all these people were basking in the sunlight, which was a picture of basically salvation and being in the kingdom of God and enjoying His blessings. This is what he writes in Grace Abounding. First of all, he, he talks about the wall. The wall, I thought, was the word that did make separation between the Christians and the world. And the gap which was in this wall, I thought, was Jesus Christ, who is the way to God the Father. But for as much as the passage was wonderful narrow, even so narrow that I could not, but with great difficulty, enter in thereat. It showed me that none could enter into life, but those who were in down, that were in downright earnest, and unless also they left this wicked world behind them. For here was only room for body and soul, but not for body and soul and sin. So again, the struggle to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus is telling us that this is the way that we must all enter the kingdom. But let's not forget, as we think about what Jesus says, let's not forget about the gospel, right? In the gospel, the Lord actually gives us the ability to do what he calls us to do. Because what do we need in order to do what the Lord calls us to do? There's nothing physically impossible with it, is there? Giving up all that we have, serving the Lord and whatever He calls us to do. 
laying our lives on the line. There's nothing physically impossible with any of these things. If there were, then, um, well, then it would be impossible, right? Uh, if he said, jump to the moon, or I want you to long jump from here to Hawaii, uh, that would be impossible. But the things he's asking us to do are not impossible physically. The only difficulty comes spiritually. It comes with the desire. Do we want to do this? The only thing we need from the condition we come into this world in order to do the things the Lord calls us to do is a change of heart. This is something we don't want to do by nature, but this is something that the Lord makes us willing and able and want to do through the gospel. He gives us His Holy Spirit. Now again, that's what we've seen over the past couple of weeks. But Jesus now goes on to tell us that if we have this kind of heart, if we have this desire, there is something else that we will be. Actually, he said this last week, but he's going to, I think, fill it out a little bit this week. We will be the salt of the earth. We will have a preserving influence in this world because we will be like the Lord Jesus, particularly in the work of evangelism, in the work of the kingdom. And that's really what Jesus turns to next. Now, this morning, we see a certain group of people coming to Jesus. People, obviously, the scribes and Pharisees didn't like. These were the tax collectors and the sinners. Tax collectors that were not Romans who were among the Jews collecting taxes. They were Jews who were among the Jews collecting taxes, and that's why their fellow countrymen looked at them as traitors, and they hated them. These sinners were not the Gentiles, and they weren't people outside the covenant people of God. These were also Jews, but Jews who were not religious, Jews that didn't worship the Lord, Jews that didn't keep the Jewish tradition. Both of these types here were the outcasts of society, and they were hated by the religious leaders. So when the scribes and the Pharisees saw them coming to Jesus, they began to criticize him. This man receives sinners and eats with them. And whether they did this audibly or not, Jesus knew what they were thinking. And so he addressed their concerns with these three parables. Again, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. Now, this morning, what I'd like us to do is just think about what these first two parables, are, what Jesus is actually saying in the parables, and then spend a little bit of time applying what, what he says here. Now, first of all, what is Jesus saying in these parables? I think you understand, as I've read them, that he's really saying the same thing in, in both of them. These are not two separate messages, but the same message. And I believe the message is this, that Jesus puts a priority on finding the lost. They are more important to him than the righteous who need no repentance. Doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love us, but it means that he is going to reach out to those who are lost and bring them into the fold while he knows that we are safe. And let's not forget that the righteous here don't, don't, doesn't necessarily mean those that belong to him. It, it can very well mean the scribes and the Pharisees in a certain sense. Now, in both parables, an owner loses something. One man loses a sheep. The woman loses one of her coins. And both of them search for what is lost until it's found. And when they find the lost item, they celebrate its recovery. I think you understand that Jesus is certainly the, the owner, right? He's the one who owns the hundred sheep. He's the one who owns the ten coins. And that's why he is the one who is concerned about them. There's a sense, I think, also in which Jesus talking about the, the owner of these things is also reproving the scribes and Pharisees. He may have them in his mind because let's not forget that they were appointed by the Lord to tend to sheep, right? They were the shepherds. And they were also supposed to keep his coins, as it were, safe. But of course, they didn't. The sheep and the coins are the Lord's people. I think in the context here, obviously, Jesus is not referring to the world. He's referring to God's covenant people. He's referring to those that belong to him. Remember how John tells us that Jesus came to his own, 
but his own did not receive him. These are the people who are in covenant with God, the ones that were his people, and he is the shepherd, the great shepherd who comes down to shepherd his people. So he's referring to those who belong to him now by way of covenant. And that also includes the scribes and the Pharisees since they were a part of God's covenant people. I'm not saying they were saved or that these people were saved or even that most of them were saved because only a few of them were actually saved, but they were God's people by covenant. Today, as we think about how we might apply this, we certainly need to see these people as being the church, but we also need to see these as people yet to be gathered into the church, the people who were lost on the outside. Jesus did not come to minister to the Gentiles, he came to seek the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this is where his focus lies. Now the fact that they're represented as sheep and as coins shows that they are precious to the one who owns them. I think you understand that what silver coins, you know, they're, they're, the word here in the Greek means drachma, but it also refers to denarii, which is a day's wages, and it was the currency of the time, and they were valuable because they were you know, used as money to, to purchase things, to pay debts, to pay taxes, and various other things like that. And sheep were also valuable because they could be used to buy things. They could be traded. They could be used for food. They could be used for clothing. And certainly they were used for sacrifice. So both of these things have value. Now the fact that they're valuable to Jesus is the reason why he's concerned. If even one of them is lost, even though the scribes and the Pharisees were not. Now, what does the lost sheep and the lost coin represent? Certainly, those who were lost, but the tax collectors and the sinners, okay? Those that are coming to listen to Jesus. These are the ones who had lost their ways, who had become traitors to Rome, who had given up the traditions, who were no longer serving and worshiping the Lord the way that they should. And even though the scribes and the Pharisees saw them as worthless, perhaps even less than worthless, so that they weren't even willing to go after them, to Jesus, they had worth. And so Jesus leaves the 99 sheep. He leaves the nine coins, those that are basically safely in his fold, safely in his purse, or at least who believe they are. Remember what Jesus said in our meditation, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Did he mean that the Pharisees were actually righteous? No, but they thought they were, and they didn't see their need for Jesus. So Jesus came to call those who saw their need for him, and that's exactly what the tax gatherers and the, and the sinners see right now. That's why they're coming to Jesus. So Jesus leaves those the self-righteous, and he goes after those who are in danger to the open pasture looking for the lost sheep, carefully sweeping the house to look for the lost coin because they are his priority. And when he finds them, he calls together his neighbors and friends to celebrate with him. Jesus says that this represents the celebration that goes on in heaven whenever one who is lost is found. He says in verse 7, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. In verse 10, I tell you, in the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know, we think about the celebration that goes on in heaven. Do you know that everyone in heaven celebrates the salvation of a lost soul? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they rejoice because one of their own comes home. The angels rejoice. The angels, remember, are those spiritual beings who are concerned about us because they were made to serve us. The author to the Hebrews tells us that they were made uh, to minister to those who would inherit salvation. These are the ones who are watching what God is doing, who long to look into his work, and who are actually involved in it because they're involved in our lives, making sure that we're going to make it safely from here to there. So when we actually are brought into the fold and are made perfectly safe, I should say eternally safe, we still have dangers in this world, but the Lord's going to keep us safe through them all, the angels rejoice. And I believe the saints also rejoice, the souls of the righteous made perfect in heaven, 
They rejoice because one of their own is soon going to join them. You know, life is but a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. It won't be long before we are with the souls of righteous men and women made perfect in heaven. Now, I don't want to say that they actually know what's going on, what we're doing here. I'm not sure that they actually do know that, but they can certainly tell from our Lord's reaction in heaven and from the reaction of the angels that one of their brethren has been brought home and they rejoice. So anyway, that's what this parable is all about, seeking the lost until they're found and the rejoicing that goes on in heaven because they are safe. Let's spend a little bit of time now thinking about how, you know, what our Lord wants us to learn from this and how we might apply it. Now, we do understand that he already what he meant by this, that it was meant as a rebuke to the scribes and the Pharisees, that this is what they should have been doing. They should have been concerned for these lost souls who were among their own countrymen, even if they didn't measure up to their self-righteous standards. They need to be concerned about those that were lost. Now, how should we apply this? Well, in, in the same way, but I think in other ways as well. First of all, we do need to be thankful yeah, because the, the scribes and Pharisees did not recognize their own need of Jesus. They were actually lost, even though they thought themselves to be righteous and found and even to be God's special and privileged few. They were lost. But we know that we are lost. If we are trusting in the Lord Jesus, we know we were lost, but we've been found. We need to be thankful that the Lord went after us. We were that lost sheep. We were that lost coin. The good shepherd carefully searched for us until he found us and brought us safely into the fold. Do you know we, we owe him everything and so we should give him what it is he desires of us and what does he want? To worship him, to love him, to serve him faithfully, to, to do all the things that we really considered at the opening of the sermon, which was the review of last week, he wants us to pursue him, to pursue the kingdom, to finish the race, to engage in the spiritual warfare and to join with him in finding others. And then we, we come to that secondly. We need to remember secondly that there are still lost sheep. There are still lost coins to be found, not only, of course, in this country, but in every country of the world. Uh, you know, I, I can't help but think of this. Any of our youth around here or, or parents, of course, who've seen youth play, those kinds of video games that are, that are more acceptable where you kind of find coins everywhere, right? You, you hit something, a bunch of coins come out and so forth. You go through the game looking for coins and you, you try to treasure those things up. Well, in a certain sense, that illustrates what our Lord wants us to do. Everywhere we should be going, we should be looking for those lost coins. We should be seeking those lost sheep, because they are there. They're out there. They're still there. If they weren't out there, then our Lord Jesus would already have come, right? Because once all the sheep are gathered in, once all the elect are in, as it were, those the Lord has chosen and sent Jesus into the world to save, once that last sinner has come to faith in Jesus, it's going to bring an end to all things. Our Lord Jesus is going to return, and he's going to basically gather all the living and raise all the dead to the final judgment, then there's going to be the final separation. If all of them had been saved, then we would be basically on the new earth right now enjoying those blessings. So there are people yet to be gathered in. Now, thirdly, since there are those yet to be gathered in, we really need to see them as our priority because that's the way the Lord sees them. There are several things that our Lord wants us to do. We've already talked about some of them. He wants us to worship Him. He wants us to worship Him together. That's why we gather together on the Lord's Day in order to praise Him and pray to Him and to hear His Word. He wants us to be discipled. That's one of the reasons why He wants His Word preached, explained. He wants it applied. We, we need to grow in, in the knowledge of the Lord so we can put it into practice. The Lord wants us to gather together so that we can serve one another by using the gifts He has given to us to help one another to be all that we can be for the Lord. But we also need to understand that what we're doing here is, is really subordinate to a greater goal. 
And that goal is found in the Great Commission. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What we're doing here is a part of this. But the other part, of course, is getting out there and you know, going and sharing the gospel with others. Our worship, our discipleship, our service to one another is really a means to prepare and equip us to complete this task. Not the only reason why we do this, but it's certainly a very important one. We worship the Lord because He's worthy. You know, we need to, to do that. That's what we do as creatures. We worship the Creator because He deserves our worship. But as we worship Him, He's not the one who really benefits from it because He's already infinitely blessed. But we benefit from it. We grow in grace. We become more like Jesus. We become better equipped to do what our Lord calls us to do, which is to complete this task, to reach the lost, that we might make them disciples. So Jesus wants us to go. He wants us to seek them at home. He wants us to seek them abroad. He wants us to evangelize them, which essentially means just to share the gospel with them, explain the gospel to them, show them why they need the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not forget the use of the law in this. We don't just give them the gospel, we, but we incorporate the law to show them why they need a Savior, why they need the gospel. So he wants us to share these things, explain these things to them. He wants us to, as a church, baptize them when they believe and are received into the church. And he wants us to teach them, to disciple them, to, to show them everything that Jesus has shown us so that they will be equipped to serve him also in this great work. Jesus says this is really our priority. But again, the way we, we apply this is going to be different for each one of us. This does not necessarily mean that Jesus wants us to right now, all of us go overseas and become foreign missionaries. You know, some of you who know me know that I <clears throat> really have a, a deep appreciation for a, a brother who's with the Lord now, whose name is Keith Green. And he was somebody who was very instrumental in my life because of the message that he was preaching through his singing. Well, he, he did make one mistake, I think, was rather a, a large mistake, and that is um, he would call people at the concerts he went to, all of them, everyone, without exception, to get on the boats that are on in, the, in the harbor and just, just go overseas. Don't even get ready, don't pack, don't do anything, just get on the boat and go. I think he was mistaken there, although I think he had the right idea. We needed to go and we needed to evangelize, but not all of us are called to go overseas. I mean, some of us... Maybe the Lord may call some of us to do that, but all of us certainly are called to share the gospel with those who are around us. All of us are called to pray for those people around us and those we share the gospel with and for our missionaries and for those that they're ministering to that the Lord might save them. All of us are called to give so that those who go to the field might actually be able to devote their whole time to sharing the gospel with others. And I realize that there are those people who are basically tent makers like the Apostle Paul who, who go there with a full-time occupation and then they essentially um, finance themselves and they evangelize in their spare time. And certainly that works as well. But it's also, um, there are places where you can't do that. And I think Africa might be one of them. Uh, you might be able to um, do some farming, and, but, but the work takes up your whole time, your whole life. You don't have time to evangelize or to do the missionary work. When I was in college, we had um, a, a teacher who had gone on the mission field, and he said that uh, where he went, it was fairly primitive, <laughs> and uh, he had to have a servant to do all of his, his daily chores and work Otherwise, that's all he would have been able to do, just, just survive. So this enables them to devote themselves to the work the Lord has called them to do. We need to try to, of course, help them and support them and to try to make that work easier for them on the field or more effective. We need to be involved. You know, at, at whatever level, we need to be concerned about gathering our Lord's sheep 
We need to see the lost as, as Jesus sees them, as, as valuable, because the Father has given them to Jesus as the reward for His work. We also need to see them as our brothers and sisters. You realize that every single sheep that is brought safely into the fold is, is our brother and our sister for eternity. So why not be concerned about them now, right? And try to reach out to them now and pray for them now. We need to rejoice when one of them is saved because the Lord rejoices, the angels rejoice, our brothers and sisters in heaven, they rejoice. And we should rejoice and we, of course, reach out to them and do what we can to help them and rejoice when they're saved, even if they happen to be among the outcasts of our society, right? Because let's not forget who Jesus is talking about here, the ones that are lost, the ones that the, the Pharisees and the scribes despised, okay? We should not be those who despise anyone, but we should be thankful when the Lord saves anyone. We should try to be mindful of everyone who is in need of salvation. Jesus ministered to everyone who came to him, didn't he? The Pharisees, there weren't too many Pharisees that came to him, but he ministered to them, right? And even though they're often trying to ensnare him, he still did good by trying to point them to the truth. But there was at least one sincere Pharisee that came to him, and that was Nicodemus. And I think we see Nicodemus actually was converted. He was with Joseph of Arimathea to bury the body of Jesus in the end because he was a follower of Jesus. Uh, Jesus received Pharisees. He received the more ordinary Jews. There were many people who followed him, and he ministered to them. He fed them. He healed them. He taught them. And Jesus ministered to the outcasts, such as the tax collectors and the sinners and the prostitutes and anyone who would come to him. The gospel is for everyone. And so we need to share it with everyone. We need to make that our priority. May the Lord then give to us that heart, give us that grace to seek after the lost in whatever way he has given us to do it. As the Apostle Paul tells us, we need to buy up the opportunities that the Lord gives us because there's only so many of them, right? We only get so many of them. We need to be watching for them, ready for them, and ready to use them whenever the Lord should grant us uh, that privileged opportunity. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to do this.